Hey guys, and welcome to week 9 of Anatomy and Physiology Lab. We'll be spending two labs studying the muscular system. During our first lab, we'll be covering Exercise 12, Microscopic Anatomy and Organization of Skeletal Muscle, as well as studying the muscles of the head, neck, and trunk. During our second lab, we'll be studying the muscles of the upper and lower limbs on both cadavers and limb models. Most of the muscle tissue in the body is skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle shapes the body and gives you the ability to move. The remaining muscle tissue of the body consists of smooth muscle that forms the walls of hollow organs and cardiac muscle that forms the walls of the heart. Skeletal muscle is made up of relatively large, long, cylindrical cells called muscle fibers. Since hundreds of embryonic cells fuse to produce each muscle fiber, the cells are multinucleate. Multiple oval nuclei can be seen just beneath the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is called the sarcolemma in these cells. The nuclei are pushed peripherally by the longitudinally arranged myofibrils, long, rod-shaped organelles that nearly fill the sarcoplasm, the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. Alternating light and dark bands along the length of the myofibrils give the muscle fiber its striped appearance. Myofibrils are made up of even smaller, thread-like structures called myofilaments. The myofilaments are composed largely of two varieties of contractile proteins, actin and myosin, which slide past each other during muscle activity to bring about the shortening or contraction of the muscle cells. The actual contractile units of muscle, called sarcomeres, extend from the middle of one eye band to the middle of the next along the length of the myofibrils. Keep in mind that these myofilaments make up the myofibrils, the organelles of the muscle fibers. The myofibrils are composed of repeating sections of sarcomeres, perfectly lined up with one another within the cell. This allows for uniform contraction of the muscle. Going back to the zoomed-in section of the myofibril, we see that there are many bands, discs, zones, and lines within each sarcomere. Remember that the sarcomere is the contractile unit of muscle, from Z-disc to Z-disc. Let's take a more in-depth look at the different bands, discs, zones, and lines. The I-band is a section of the sarcomere where only actin is present. The Z-disc is the center of the I-band and forms the bookends of the sarcomere. The A-band is the section of the sarcomere where myosin and actin overlap. The H zone is an area within the A band where only myosin is present. The M line is an area within the H zone where thick myosin filaments are linked by accessory proteins. At each junction of the A and I bands, the sarcolemma indents into the muscle cell, forming a transverse tubule or T tubule. These tubules run deep into the muscle fiber between cross channels or terminal cisterns of the elaborate smooth endoplasmic reticulum called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. Regions where the terminal cisterns border a T-tubule on either side are called triads. Thousands of muscle fibers are bundled together with connective tissue to form the organs we refer to as skeletal muscles. Each muscle fiber is enclosed in a delicate, areolar connective tissue sheath called the endomycium. Several sheathed muscle fibers are wrapped by a membrane called the paramycium, forming a bundle of muscle fibers called a fascicle. A large number of fascicles are bound together by a much coarser overcoat of dense irregular connective tissue called the epimycium, which wraps the entire muscle. The endomycium, paramycium, and epimycium all converge to form strong cord-like tendons, connecting muscle to bone. The voluntary skeletal muscle cells must be stimulated by motor neurons via nerve impulses. Each axon of the motor neuron usually divides into many branches called terminal branches as it approaches the muscle. Each of these branches ends in an axon terminal that participates in forming a neuromuscular junction with a single muscle fiber. Because of this, a single neuron may stimulate many muscle fibers. Together, the neuron and all the muscle fibers it stimulates make up the functional structure called the motor unit. 
The junction between an axon of a motor neuron and a muscle fiber is called a neuromuscular junction. The neuron and muscle fiber membranes, as close as they are, don't actually touch. They're separated by a small, fluid-filled gap called the synaptic cleft. Within the axon terminals are many mitochondria and vesicles containing a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, or ACH. When an action potential reaches the axon terminal, voltage-gated calcium channels open. Calcium enters the axon terminal and causes acetylcholine to be released by exocytosis. The acetylcholine rapidly diffuses across the synaptic cleft and combines with the receptors on the sarcolemma. When the receptors bind acetylcholine, a change in the permeability of the sarcolemma occurs. Ion channels open briefly, depolarizing the sarcolemma and causing the muscle fibers to contract. In exercise 13, we'll be studying the gross anatomy of the muscular system. As you know, skeletal muscles enable movement. Most often, movements require the coordinated action of several skeletal muscles working together. Muscles that are most responsible for producing a particular movement are called prime movers, or agonists. Muscles that oppose or reverse a movement are called antagonists. When a prime mover is active, the fibers of the antagonist are stretched and in a relaxed state. Antagonists can be prime movers in their own right. For example, the biceps muscle of the arm, a prime mover of flexion at the elbow, is antagonized by the triceps a prime mover of extension at the elbow. Remembering the names of skeletal muscles can be difficult, but certain clues help. Muscles are named on the basis of the following criteria. Some muscles are named for the direction in which their muscle fibers run with reference to the midline of the body. A muscle with fibers running parallel to the midline will have the term rectus or straight in its name. For example, the rectus abdominis is the straight muscle of the abdomen. Likewise, the terms transverse and oblique indicate that the muscle fibers will run at right angles and obliquely to the midline. The transverse abdominis and internal and external obliques are examples of this. Terms such as maximus, largest, minimus, smallest, longus, long, and brevis, short, are often used in naming muscles. The gluteus maximus is larger than the gluteus medius. Some muscles are named for the bone in which they are associated with. For example, the temporalis muscle overlies the temporal bone. When the term biceps, triceps, or quadriceps forms a part of a muscle name, you can generally assume that the muscle has two, three, or four origins, respectively. For example, the biceps brachii has two origins. The location of the muscle attachments can also help you name the muscle. For example, the sternocleidomastoid muscle has its origin on the sternum, sterno, and clavicle, clido, and inserts on the mastoid process. Muscle shape and muscle action can also provide clues to name the muscle. For example, the deltoid muscle is roughly triangular, and the trapezius muscle resembles a trapezoid. All the adductor muscles of the anterior thigh bring about the adduction of the leg and all the extensor muscles of the wrist extend the hand. During week one, we'll study the muscles of the head, neck, and trunk. During week two, we'll study the muscles of the upper and lower limbs.